All right, I'd like you to picture yourself. Again, this is a smaller representation, and we'll get to all of this, but picture yourself at a holiday table. You're at the banquet. You're at the party. And it gets better than that. Not only are you at the party, but Jesus shows up at the party, which would be a pretty cool party, right? Or a terrifying party, depending on what you think of Jesus. But uh, Jesus is happy that you're there, and he's glad that you're there, and he's so excited for you to be a part of his party. Not only is Jesus there, but God the Father is there, and you're welcome to be at that table, and God's Holy Spirit is there, and that Spirit's present at that table, and you are part of this perfect space where you're in communion and fellowship, and you're experiencing the presence of God's love and power. Try to picture that. All right. Now imagine something pulled you from that space, pulled you from that table of love and into a pit, into darkness, which I've so powerfully illustrated with this carpet here. <laughs> We're in the midst of this series called What is Love? And we've said that, that God is love and that God proves his love for us, that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. We're a community that confesses and believes that Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross, his self-giving, uh, self-emptying action towards us is what love really is. That, that self-giving, self-sacrificing action for the good of others. And we believe Jesus has shown us the fullness of God's love and healed us and brought us salvation to redeem us, to pull us out from the pit and bring us to what we're made for, which is communion with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That, that we are actually made for this table. That we're made to be in the presence of God, to know God's love. And in fact, the, the whole vision for, uh, we've been talking about this, this Realized 2025 vision, and we have groups. The whole goal of that is that we as a community would realize the, the fullness and deeper, on a deeper level, what it means to have fellowship with Christ, what it means to be in God's presence, to experience more of that love that we're made for. And out of that, we're, we're made to extend that love to one another and help each other and be at that table together as brothers and sisters in Christ, sharing in Christ's love. And that from that table, we're called to be light and witnesses for the love and grace and truth of Jesus to help bring other people into that space so that they too can experience God's love, right? That's at the heart of what church is about, experiencing, knowing the love that God has for us, loving one another, and then helping and guiding and, and leading and sharing so that others might come to that table as well. We've said that without this love, we are nothing, that this is the real love. There's all kinds of false loves out there that will leave us empty. But without this love, even if we had all the other gifts that the world has to offer, even if we had really powerful God-given gifts, but without the love that we see in Christ, without this real love, we're nothing. We've said that this love is patient and kind, and we've looked at the love of Jesus and how Christ's love is patient with us and how it's kind with us. And then we've talked and discussed as a community, okay, how can we live in this kind love? How can we live with this patient love? Today, we're going to look at some things that pull us away from this love. In what uh, Scott and Anne read, we talked about how love, they, they read 1 Corinthians 13, this, this powerful passage about, about love, that uh, without love, we're nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. And then it says, love is not envious. Love is not arrogant. Love is not boastful. There are things, there's love over here where we're made for, and then there are things that are not love, that are anti-love, that are seeking to pull us away into the pit, away from real love. Love is not envious. It is not arrogant. It is not boastful. Yet there's something in our flesh right now. There's something in us that's pulling us away from the love of God and pulls us towards these things like arrogance and envy and boasting, and they pull us away from love. There's a world around us, and if you have eyes to see, you can tell this. I don't need to prove this, I think. If you look around the world around us, it is a world full of envy, a world that, that breeds envy. If you watch the news or if you're on social media or if you just 
Put any screen on, there will be advertisements moving you to envy. We live in a world of self-promotion, of arrogance, of boasting. There's not just a flesh inside of us, but a world around us that seeks to pull us away from the love of God we experience, that we're made for. Not only in our hearts, in our flesh, not only in the world around us, but we confess and believe that there are spiritual forces at work. There are evil forces, demonic forces, that want to pull us away. That we aren't just dealing with with flesh and blood in this world, but there's a spiritual reality to this world. And there are spiritual forces that are anti-God, that are against the love of Christ, that want to pull us away and into the pit. But there's good news against all of those forces. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Love is not envious, love is not arrogant, love is not boastful. Yet there's something in us that's driving us there. The good news is that Jesus who died for us and loved us and gave himself for us to bring us to this table, to do all that was necessary to keep us, to put us to this table, is the same one who shows us the way and the path to remain in love and to remain and stay at the love table. And that's what we're going to look at today. This Jesus... Uh, in the same way that we're tempted and tried by what's going on inside of us, that we're tempted and tried by demonic forces, that we're tempted and tried by this world to pull us from the love of God, Jesus, too, experienced that trial and temptation, and he shows us the way to resist it. So if you've wrestled with this, and I think we all have, if you've wrestled with envy, if you wrestle with arrogance, if you wrestle with boasting, if you, if you wrestle with something in you pulling you away from God's love or something you leaving you outside of God's love and the forces to come here, th- there's good news. And we're going to look at a story today where Jesus shows us. He shows us the way to remain in the love of God. He shows us how to resist that temptation. And that's what we're going to look at today. And quite simply, I'm going to tell you a story where Jesus is being pulled. Uh, Satan himself is coming and trying to pull Jesus away from the love of God. And I, I want us to see how Jesus resists that temptation because he is, he is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our way. He is our guide. And if he's not your guide and way today, I, I want to show you why he should be because he's so good. But he's going to show us. And as I share the story, I want you to, to hear this prayer first. This is a prayer uh, by a, a man who converted to Christianity. His name is Mustafa. And I read this at, at Easter at the um, sunrise service. The prayer goes, Oh God, I am Mustafa the tailor. The whole day long I sit and pull the needle and the thread through the cloth. Oh God, you are the needle and I am the thread. I am attached to you and I follow you. As I tell this story, I just want you to look to Jesus and imagine yourself as the thread that's tied to Jesus. Because in our own power and our own strength, we, we get pulled away from the love of God by powerful forces of what's going on inside of us, of the world around us, of even uh, spiritual forces. But as I tell this story, if you can just simply see yourself tied to Jesus like thread to a needle then all we have to do as the people of God to remain in his love is just stick with Jesus and go where he goes and let his ways be our ways. All right. Let me tell you this story. I like this one. I'm a preacher. I like most of the stories about Jesus. Actually, I like all of them. It's kind of part of the, part of the rule. Um, Jesus stands on the bank of the Jordan River. It's really more than a creek, than a river. It's not a, if you see it in person, you're not going to be as impressed, right? Uh, He sits at the bank of this Jordan River. There are crowds. Crowds are coming to receive a baptism. Crowds are coming, putting them, going into this water, seeking a repentance of their sins, seeking a forgiveness, seeking a change of life. There's this wild looking man named John that's baptizing people. He's Jesus' cousin. Uh, Little background information. Uh, John is so into baptizing people that his last name becomes the Baptist, right? He's baptizing people. Everyone's coming into these waters. Jesus comes to the waters, and he comes to John to be baptized. 
And John's like, oh, hold on a second. You want me to baptize you? You're, you're Jesus. This doesn't make sense. Jesus says, it's okay. It's okay, John. This is the way it's supposed to go. So John says, okay. John baptizes Jesus, plunges him into the water. As he's pulling Jesus out of the water, the heavens open up. A voice from heaven speaks, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my son, the beloved one. I am pleased with him. And as this voice from the heaven, which is God the Father, comes and speaks these words upon his son, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus like a dove. This is the table, but in the water, right? This is a picture of, of the love of God, right? And we don't have time to get into all the nature of the Trinity, but this is one of the best pictures here of the Father fully loving the Son, the Son receiving this praise and blessing from the Father, and the Spirit being at work in all of it. This is the, the table, the perfect picture of love, the communion that Jesus exists in and that in Christ we're all made for. Powerful moment. Immediately after that, Jesus is driven away from that moment, away from the refreshing waters of baptism, away from the powerful words spoken by his father, and he's driven into a deserted, dry, quiet place. He's driven into the wilderness. And he's fasting for 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, the adversary, the devil, slithers up alongside of him and comes to speak to him. And this fasted Jesus sitting there and the voice of the adversary says, Jesus, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus, you have power in yourself. You're Jesus, right? Jesus, you're self-sufficient. Jesus, you don't need anybody. Jesus, you have strength in your own power. Jesus, regular people couldn't do this stuff. They might have to rely on other people for help. But Jesus, you're the self-sufficient one. You can do this in your own strength. You can do this in your own power. Satan tempts Jesus to arrogance. Jesus, you have the ability to do this. And Jesus responds, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is pulled to this moment to consider arrogance, to consider his self-sufficiency, and he says, no, no, Satan, I don't live in my own strength. I don't live in my own power. I don't live in my own ability to, to, to puff myself up, to prove my worth. I don't live in, in my own ability to get things for myself. All of my existence, all I have, every morsel of bread, everything more important than bread is whatever proceeds forth from the mouth of God. Jesus knows his scriptures. He knows the beginning story is that God breathed life into Adam, that all existence, that all that we have is not what we gain for ourselves. It's not living in our own arrogance to get what we ever think we can get, that we'll ever be self-sufficient in our own. No, the very breath of God, all that we have comes from the mouth of God. And if God would remove his breath, then we go back to nothing. Satan continues. He brings Jesus to the top of the temple. So he brings Jesus to the holy city, Jerusalem, puts him atop the holy place. This is the holiest place in all of the earth for the Israelites. Puts him on the top of the tent, temple mount. He's close to where, where, where Yahweh is to be in the holy of holies. He's close to that holy space. He's, all right, Jesus. Good for you. You're right. You rely on God. Okay. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down from this temple. 
throw yourself down from the temple. And Satan says, it, it's written, right? The prophets said, I believe the prophets, yeah. Um, his angels, he'll give his angels charge over you and they'll, they won't let your, I'm blanking on this a little bit, <laughs> they'll, they'll raise you up so that your heel won't even touch the stone. Basically, throw yourself down, God will send his angels, they'll take care of you, they'll lift you up, it is written, I, I, this is what the Bible says, Jesus, they, they will lift you up. Okay, Jesus, you don't rely on your own power, but Jesus... Why don't you prove for us? Why don't you boast a little? Why don't you show everyone the power of God? Why don't you prove to us this God? Prove how powerful he is. Prove how awesome he is. Jesus, do something to go viral here. Listen, Jesus is in the heart of Jerusalem. He's surrounded by Israelites in this space. This is the sacred city. The people, the Israelites, they're there waiting and longing and hoping for their God to show up and prove that their God is greater and better than the Roman gods. They're waiting for vindication. They're waiting for, for uh, political and, and military salvation. Jesus, here's your moment. Jesus, show us. Boast a little bit, Jesus. Show us the bigness, the power of God. Jesus says, no, <laughs> it's written. You shall not put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test. We boast because we're not sure we're loved. At the root of all boasting is an uncertainty about whether we're fully and completely loved, Right? Why do you have to boast? Why would Jesus need his father to show up, right? If Jesus was uncertain of his father's love, then maybe Jesus would have to do something to see if God could prove himself to him so that Jesus would know he's loved. Jesus says, no, I know I'm being tested now, but I, I, I won't put my father to the test. There's no boasting here. My love is secure. He says, I won't put the Lord my God to the test. He knows his eternity is wrapped up with the Father and with the Spirit. He has heard the Father's blessing and the Father's words. And while he's in the darkness and the wilderness, there's that temptation to say, does God still really love me? Do I have to do something? Can I do something to show? Does this have to look good for the world? Do people have to see this? If people see this, then maybe I'll feel better. Then maybe I'll know this is real. Then maybe I'll know I'm loved by God. No, Jesus says, I, I have the Father's love. There's no boasting here. The Father doesn't have to prove his love for me. I won't put him to the test. Satan shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world. He says, Jesus, I have some power over this. I have some access to all the kingdoms of the world. Jesus, does that seem right? <laughs> I imagine Satan sitting there with Jesus like, you know, good things are supposed to happen to good people. Bad things are supposed to happen to bad people. Here I am, Jesus. I have access to all of this. I have some power over this. Here you are famished. Here you are weak. Here you are. You're supposed to be the king. You're the son of God. You're the, the rightful king of all creation. Something's off, Jesus. Jesus, I, I can give you this. Jesus, don't you deserve this? Jesus, wouldn't it be better for you to have this? So Satan says, Jesus, I'll give you all of this. Just bow down and worship me. Satan offers Jesus envy. Jesus, I'll give you this. Wouldn't you want this? Don't you want this? Don't you deserve this? Uh, the devil has something completely right. Envy is idolatry. Satan knows that envy and idolatry are two sides of the same coin. That 
The goal of envy, the work of envy, is it takes our eyes off of our true life, our true love, our true object of worship. Envy takes our eyes and puts them on some other object of worship. And Satan knows that really well. That's why he has to make the offer he makes to Jesus, which is, I'll give you everything. Jesus, put your eyes on all the kingdoms that you'd want. All it takes is you have to take your eyes off the Father and bow your knee to me. Jesus says, no, get away, Satan. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Envy is the only sin that gives no pleasure whatsoever. You're just constantly envying something. Um, envy in, in Latin, uh, let me see the word real quick. Oh my goodness, I wrote this down. Oh, invitia. Invitia is the Latin word for envy. It means looking upon with the evil eye or looking to something with hostility. Uh, in, in Dante's great classic medieval work, the, uh, the uh, Divine Comedy, there, he has these stories about hell and about, about hell and about purgatory and about heaven. Um, there's these uh, people stricken with envy, and they're climbing the mountain of purgatory, so they're seeking to stay away from hell and to move towards heaven. And what, what, um, what keeps them in chains, what keeps them in bondage is envy, and they've sewn their eyes shut. That's their solution to envy, because they know how powerful it is and that it will drag them back to the pit. When Jesus talks in the Sermon on the Mount, and he talks about uh, lust and adultery, which at his heart is just sexual envy, right? When he talks about that, he says something similarly strong. He says, it's better for you to pluck your eye out to continue on your path to the Father's table than to be dragged into the pit and darkness. I think we, we live in a world and society and a culture that's full of envy and, and full of longings and full of frustrations that we don't have, that we haven't accomplished, that we don't have the things we want in life. And um, I think one of the things we do in our society and culture is we, we ruminate and discuss endlessly about kind of why do we have that desire or what's the root of it or how to fix this or how do we, and we work on ourselves over and over and over again. Um, and, and there's some good to that, and I'll get to that in a second, but with envy, the starting point is no. No. No, get away, Satan. Envy is such a treacherous, dreadful, deadly thing that when we're tempted to envy, when we're desiring something, it's taking our eyes off the Lord and casting our eyes upon something else, and it will only drag us to the pit. And Jesus' response is just an immediate no, get away, Satan, and then a confession that I worship the Lord and serve him only. It's an immediate Forceful, strong response. Whenever we're tempted with envy, that's what Jesus guides us to do. You have to, and this is what Jesus needs to do when he's tempted to shift his eyes to say, No, get away, Satan. I worship the Lord God and serve him only. Yes, we should work in our lives and discuss and figure out why there's these longings and, and where we're off and all of that. But, but when we're tempted to envy, the starting point is no. No, 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 this takes me away from God. No, this is satanic evil. No, I worship the Lord and serve him only. Satan leaves. Jesus commands him to leave. Satan leaves. And suddenly the angels came. They come and they minister to him. We envy, we boast, we get arrogant and self sufficient because we doubt the love of God that's at that table. 
I get envious. I get boastful. I get arrogant because I doubt the love of God at the table. Because I forget or get my eyes off that I have been crucified with Christ. The life that I live, I don't live for myself or by myself, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And if I remembered that, I'd keep my eyes at that table. I forget that now I'm in Christ, and that means in Christ I'm at the table with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and I am welcomed and invited to remain in that space. I envy, I boast, I get arrogant because I forget the baptismal waters. I forget that in Christ, and, and we forget that, that in Christ, the words the Father speaks to the Son are the words that we hear poured over us at our baptism, and we are called to remain in that love. That in Christ, in what he has done for us, we are to the beloved. And that God the Father looks at us and says, in you and in you and you, I am well pleased. And the Spirit descends upon us and gives us the power. And I forget, and we forget that love, and it pulls us away to envy, to arrogance, to boasting. Our arrogance is a lie from our flesh, from the world around us, from evil forces that will pull us away from the Father's love. Our arrogance, our attempts at self-sufficiency will not put a single morsel more bread on the table. It might feel like that. It might look like that. We might be proud of ourselves for a little while. But our arrogance will not ever give us more than what we've already been given by God. Right? We'll never get more in our own power, in our own pride, in our own arrogance than what has already been given to us from the hand and from the mouth of the Father. The Father who breathed that first breath into Adam, that spirit that was given from Christ to breathe upon us, to equip us for the understanding and living in the Father's love. And we can seek to live in arrogance and our self-sufficiency and stay starving and stay weak and stay forever hungry, not being enough, not having enough bread, not getting enough, not being self-sufficient enough. Or like Christ teaches us, we can say, Father, give us this day our daily bread. And we can stay at the table and receive what comes from the hand and the mouth of the Father and be satisfied in that. Boasting. We boast because we're unsure of the Father's love. I, I, I believe that. I believe if you, if you look at your life, right, when are we boasting? When do we have to say stuff? It's because we still need to prove ourselves to people, right? We boast about our accomplishments because we're wondering, hey, do you see how good I am? Do you see how worthy I am? Do you see how lovable I am? I did this, 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 and this. And we'll live in a society where, where people will, will come at us and question whether God really loves us, question whether we are fully known by God, question the reality of God. We, we live in a world where the, the dominant religion right now in our culture is, is scientism. And we're not going to dive into this, but not that science is bad. I love science. Science is great. Um, scientism is this belief that all objective reality, all the real stuff of hard sciences is what's real. And everything else, this God stuff, emotions, feelings, that's all subjective stuff that's not real. And that kind of dominates our culture. And in that world, we're going to get over and over again this, is your God really real? Prove your God. Win a debate with me. Win an argument with me. Let's have this debate. Let's have this question. Prove yourself. If God's so good to you, right? Like Jesus on the, on, on the, um, on the top of the temple. If, if God is so good to you, if God's so amazing, then why doesn't he show up and just do some awesome miracle now, prove himself, and then, and then everyone will just believe, give me some objective, real truth right now, that according to my logic, according to my way of understanding the world, I want God to do this for me. Show us. Show us. What's my answer to that? And I... I I appreciate apologetics. I love apologetic books. I like discussing the reasonableness of our, our faith in God. Uh, my first answer of, of show me the Father's love. Show this proof that God is this, this so real. I, okay, here. He died for me. 
I believe that God loved us so much and God loved this world so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for me. That, that uh, my, my, I, I don't have to, oh, what am I asking him to prove? He loved me so much. He came to heaven and earth. He suffered with me. He knows my shame. He knows my pain. He knows what it's like to be naked and alone and forsaken. He dies a grueling death on the cross He lived to love and to serve. He rose again. He gave me his spirit. He loves me and gave himself for me. I I don't need to prove him. He's already proven himself. He's already given himself completely and totally and fully to me. And and, and we ask, we say, oh, how how do I make God look better in this world? Or how do I make myself look better by showing how reason? No, like, here, here is my answer. He loves me more than anyone else has loved me. He'll love you more than any love you'll ever know. God loves you so much, he died for you. He's so good and powerful that he conquered death and hell. He loves you. Would you like to experience and know his love? Right? Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a savior. We don't need to boast in him or prove him now. We need to tell the gospel of what he has done for us and invite people to a love that's deeper and more powerful than anything they've experienced. To invite people away from a pit of hell and misery that people are living in. Our arrogance, our boasting, our envy, it's not helping us win this game called life. We need a a deeper love. Envy. Imagine yourself back at the table with God. And we're sitting there with God the Father. And we're looking away from the table, saying, God, you're holding something from me. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, right? God, there's some stuff you don't want me to look at over there. God, I see some cool stuff over there that I want. I want to, God, give me what I want so I can stay at the table. And God says, look at your older brother. Look at his hands. Look at his side. I sent him. He was crucified for you. His nails were, nails were put in his hands. The sword pierced his side. He suffered in agony and death. He rose again. He redeemed. He saved. He restored. He heals. He does all that's necessary to bring you back to this table. Remain in my love. There'll be treasure in heaven for you. One day you'll reign with him forever. All I ask is that you humbly receive my love and stay at the table with me. And my response to that is, God, I I have a neighbor. And yeah, he's not really happy. His life's not great. He's gone through a lot of stuff. He's, he's kind of sad. He doesn't really have a lot of purpose and meaning in life. God, his car is a couple years newer than mine. God, like, his vacation looked awesome. <laughs> like, they got on a plane and, like, went to one of those islands that, like, I don't know about. And, like, we're driving to Amish country again, right? Um, <laughs> I don't envy the islands. I love Amish country. Um, like, what, what are we doing? You know? Like, I, I, I love you. I'm God. I gave everything for you. I, I secured, I, I put to death your past. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit as a down payment. I've put you in a beautiful community with other brothers and sisters You're going to reign with me eternally. I want to pour out my blessings and treasure from heaven with you. Just keep your eyes off the stupid crap that's keeping you from the table. Like, uh, uh, our arrogance is a lie that pulls us from the table. Our boasting is a lie that pulls us from the table. Envy is idolatry that takes us takes our eyes off the one who made us and loved us and breathes his life into us and will one day see us face to face and wipe every tear from every eye. 
Now we know in part, but one day we will be fully known. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but one day we'll see face to face. And this Lord God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, God just asks us to stay with me. Remain in my love. I'll take care of it. It'll be okay. Be with me. Don't be a fool for lesser loves. Remain in his love. Believe, trust, confess in his love. Ask for his love. Ask for his spirit. If, if you've never understood his love, then go to him now and pray. Pray for forgiveness. Pray for healing. Talk to us. We'll lead you through the waters of baptism. We want you to know that you are the Father's beloved child wrapped up in the glory and goodness and saving work of Christ and love of Christ. Believe that now if you don't believe it. Receive that love. Know that love. Embrace that love and come be a part of the table. If you believe that, if you know it, then remember it. Keep your eyes fixed on that love, on the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And say no. Say no, I worship the Lord and serve him only. No, I have no need to test God who's proven himself. No, I don't need to live and scrounge for my own bread like Cain in the wilderness, the marked cursed one. I have the blessing and markings of Christ I in him receive all that comes from the hand of the Father. I'm going to read the end of Romans chapter 8 because I think it's words that we need in our head and in our hearts to keep us at the table and then I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to worship again in song. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? Who's going to pull us? Who has the power to pull us away? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of the Father, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it's written, for your sake we're being killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep to the slaughter. No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor satanic forces, nor demonic forces, nor angelic beings, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Tie yourself to the needle that is Christ so that he can keep you at the table and remain in love at his table that he has won for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, give us your blessing, your power. Fill us with what we need to remain in your love. Lord, empower us, equip us to say no to all that pulls us away from your love. Give us your power and strength and equipping to help us Reject all that keeps us from hearing the Father's voice in the baptism waters. From all that would direct our gaze away from the Father at the table to lesser loves. Lord, I pray for this community. I, I pray for us as we're seeking to realize all that it means to know you and to love you and to live for you. Draw us deeper into your presence. Help us do that in whichever ways we need. Help us seek you in prayer to remember. Help us seek you in the scriptures to remember. Uh, as as, as uh, Lord Jesus, as you in this moment had the scriptures flowing out of you to remind you, give that to us as well. Help us seek you there. Lord, hem us in into a deeper relationship with you so that we would be people 
that would not be drawn away, and instead that we would be people as salt and light and people that would carry the living water and carry the bread from the table to feed and to refresh others to bring them to your table. Lord, help us not be drawn from your table by our sin and by the world and by by evil forces, but help us be ambassadors that go to pull and drag other people towards your love and, and, and pull them from the grips of Satan and from the grips of the world and from the grips of their very flesh to know a love better than anyone has ever known. Lord, equip us. Lord, breathe in us. Lord, move in us in this hour and the days ahead. I, I pray for the, the realized gatherings that will happen this afternoon and tomorrow as we share our testimonies. I pray that that Two, in that moment are times that we are just reminded again about your love and how you've drawn us to you. Lord, thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. We honor you. Help us remain in your love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.